I am still coming to grips with the terrible and tragic events of Charlottesville a couple of weeks ago. Still aghast at the sheer ugliness it revealed in our nation. Not a new ugliness, mind you. An ugliness that has long been here, but one that I've been, for the most part, naive enough to underestimate or privileged enough to overlook my day-to-day -day life untouched by it. But this week, I watched the chilling documentary on Charlottesville by Vice News, a 22-minute piece where correspondent L. Reeve goes behind the scenes during the rally itself to interview both the white nationalist leaders and the counter-protesters. It's something we all should watch. It's easily found on the internet. Though I will warn you that it is in equal parts horrifying and terrifying and enragingly offensive. In the video, you hear white nationalist leader Chris Cantwell call the vehicular manslaughter of Heather Heyer an acceptable loss and actually blame its occurrence on counter-protesters, not the driver of the car. Cantwell speaks of yet more death and violence to come as he smugly unpacks for the camera the weaponry he carried to the rally. Two assault rifles and three pistols and a knife. As he speaks, he holds Jews, Muslims, and racial ethnic minorities in complete contempt. In short, he proudly and publicly espouses everything that I would wish to condemn. Everything. There were hundreds more like him in Charlottesville and later in Boston and planning for other rallies yet to come. Robert Ray, another white nationalist, proclaims to the camera, we're showing this parasitic class of anti-white vermin that this is our country. It was built by our forefathers and it's going to remain our country. That which is degenerate in white countries will be removed. Watching, I found myself thinking, I want him gone. I want him rooted out. And I clenched my teeth and I clenched my fists and I felt violence and vileness in my own spirit rising in response to the violence and vileness in his. Before the video, I might have said, I don't have an enemy in the world. But these people, with their hateful and hostile intent, well, the dictionary definition of enemy is a person who demonstrates hatred for, fosters harmful designs against, or engages in antagonistic activities against another, an adversary or an opponent. So I must revise my simplistic assessment. I don't seek out enemies. I don't desire to create enemies. But I have enemies. That's a hard thought. And a harder thought is that my faith, this Christianity that I seek to live out, tells me what I am to do in response to my enemies and challenges me that the way I naturally want to respond to them is wrong. In our scripture lesson from Matthew's Gospel, Jesus says, You have heard that it was said, Love your neighbor and hate your enemy. But I tell you, love your enemies and pray for those who persecute you that you may be children of your father in heaven he causes his son to rise on the evil and the good and sends rain on the righteous and the unrighteous in our second scripture lesson Paul writes do not repay anyone evil for evil but take thought for what is noble in the sight of all do not be overcome by evil but overcome evil with good and of course, I've learned these words all my life, and I've believed them in an abstract way. But how does one make them more than words and show love directly and specifically toward hate-filled people in the way that Paul and Jesus both challenge us to do? 
As I contemplated that enormous challenge, I recalled a helpful image, not from the Bible, but from Madeline Lingle's 1963 Newbery award-winning science fiction fantasy book, A Wrinkle in Time. Now I'll give you a bit of a backstory in case you're unfamiliar with the book. The book tells the story of a rescue mission, you might say, in which 13-year-old Meg Murray and her precocious five-year-old brother Charles Wallace, along with their high school-aged companion Calvin, must travel through space and time to find Meg's father, Dr. Murray, who has mysteriously vanished during a scientific experiment. There's a scene early in the novel where the three young rescuers are transported to another distant world from which they are given a bird's eye view of the universe. And in this broadened view of things, they see a darkness, a shadow, a terrifying blackness that is slowly spreading across space, consuming entire planets and blotting out the light of the stars. And while the blackness does not yet consume the earth, it shadows it. To rescue their father, the children must travel to Kamazots, the planet that's at the very heart of the darkness. When they arrive at Kamazots, they discover that the inhabitants of that dark planet are all controlled by a single group mind, literally a giant evil brain known as it that governs all of their thoughts and their actions. As more and more people are brought under its influence, the darkness spreads and planets fall and the blight upon the universe continues to grow. The power of this terrible mind is immense. It mesmerizes and hypnotizes and draws people into its sway. And here on Kamazots, the children find their father not yet consumed or controlled by it, but powerless to escape. Now just that much of the story, the spreading darkness, the hypnotic powerful group mind that invades and controls people's thoughts, words, and actions, the earth itself falling under a threatening shadow. All of that came to me this week as I pondered the present state of things. It isn't too great a leap to make a connection between the book's fictitious evil mind that is spreading darkness and endangering our planet and a very real evil mindset that is spreading darkness and endangering our planet. With that connection made, I'll tell a bit more of the story. In the course of rescuing the children's father, Charles Wallace, the brilliant five-year-old, falls under the influence of it. So now Meg must face off with the evil brain to save her brother from its poison. She goes back to Kamazots, armed only with the counsel of Mrs. Witch, a mysterious being who has been a guide on their journey. And Mrs. Witch has told Meg, you have something that it has not. This something is your only weapon, but you must find it for yourself. Well, the book reaches a climactic confrontation between Meg and it, which now speaks through her brother, Charles Wallace. Meg herself is in danger of falling under its terrible sway, and it feels as though only her anger can protect her. As long as I can stay angry enough, it can't get me, Meg thinks. And now I'll quote from the book. Meg felt only anger toward this boy who was not Charles Wallace at all. No, it was not anger. It was loathing. It was hatred, sheer and unadulterated. And as she became lost in her hatred, she also began to be lost in it. Her stomach churned in its rhythm. Her body trembled with the strength of her hatred and the strength of it. And suddenly Meg has a realization. Her hatred of it is no protection. The weapon she has, the one thing it does not have that she has been counseled to seek out is love. 
Again, I'll quote from the book. But how could she use her love? What was she meant to do? If she could give love to it, perhaps it would shrivel up and die, for she was sure it could not withstand love. But she, in all her weakness, was incapable of loving it. Perhaps it was not too much to ask of her, but she could not do it. But she could love Charles Wallace. Now I spoke of the book being helpful in my wrestling to love my enemies. What Meg is able to do in the book is to hold separate Charles Wallace and the evil mind that is controlling him. She cannot love it, but she can love him. And because she is able to hold them separate, he becomes able to separate himself and it becomes his salvation. So to bring this back at last to my difficulty with Charlottesville. My dilemma is precisely Meg's. In response to the white supremacists depicted in the documentary, my anger feels so right and so righteous. It feels like the only thing strong enough to combat them. But what my faith calls me to do is to hold separate the person from the evil mindset that has sway over them. I cannot love it, in other words, but I can strive to love them. Now here's the difficulty. In the book, Meg has a pre-existing relationship with her brother. She already loves her brother. It's not difficult to focus her love upon her brother because she knew and loved him before it overcame him. I don't have a pre-existing love of these white supremacists. They are not my brothers, at least not genetically. So I must work to discover a love for them. And that work, I think, must begin with compassion. Children are not born hating. They are born lovely and innocent and without malice. Every child is a child of God. What must a child go through or endure to become so filled with malice and hatred that it utterly overtakes them? What sort of home? What set of experiences produces a person like the people in the Charlottesville video? What evil must they have been marinated in for it to flow out of them? Through compassion, I can begin to love the child of God that this person still remains, even as I loathe and abhor what has been done to them and what now flows out of them. It's the beginning of the spiritual exercise of separating the person from the mindset that now rules them. And as I become able to do that, I begin to hold separate the human being from the hate. I can act with love toward them to the best of my ability. And that in turn creates a space for love to begin to do its work. I read this week a concrete, though difficult, example of how that's done. It's the story of Daryl Davis, an African-American blues musician who plays piano with a boisterous, upbeat, boogie-woogie style. Back in 1983, Davis was playing with a band in what was an intentionally all-white country and western bar in Maryland. And a bar patron came up to him and said it was the first time he had heard a black man play piano as well as Jerry Lee Lewis. Davis explained to the man that Jerry Lee learned to play from black blues and boogie-woogie piano players, and he's a friend of mine. The white patron was skeptical, and they agreed to discuss it further over a drink. And in the course of the conversation, the man admitted that he was a member of the Ku Klux Klan. Davis might have walked away from him then and there. 
but he remained in the conversation and he spoke to the man as a human being and not as a KKK member. And the evening ended with the man asking Davis when he'd be playing there again. Whenever Davis returned to play at the bar, the man would come and bring his friends. And Davis would each time greet the man by name and show him caring. Eventually, the man became unable to reconcile his hatred of African Americans with the caring and friendship Davis continued to show toward him. The man eventually left the KKK and gave Davis his robe as a symbol of announcing his formerly held views. And he also introduced Davis to some of his friends. Davis now maintains a collection of robes and hoods and other clan memorabilia given to him over the years by others who have ceased to participate in the clan through their interaction with him. Davis responded as Meg does in the book A Wrinkle in Time. He engaged the person and not the mindset that held sway over him. Now not all of Davis's interactions with clan members have been successes. The world's not that easy. He's been cursed and he's been threatened and he's been hit. But he also knows that hate cannot cast out hate. Only love can do so. A second well-known example is that of Megan Phelps Roper, the young woman who grew up as a child of the Westboro Baptist Church. The group famed for showing up at funerals with signs saying, God hates fags, or God hates America, or pray for more dead soldiers. Her father was Fred Phelps, the founder and leader of the church. And Phelps Roper relates that growing up, she was convinced that the group was right and righteous that their message would cause people to realize the price of an unrepentant life or lifestyle and to turn to God thereby saving their souls she was certain of it because it was all she had ever been taught eventually as a child of the age of technology she began to interact with people on social media at first engaging them in the sort of hot and unhelpful debates that social media is famous for but a small few of the folks with whom she interacted, a very small few, including the man she eventually married, took time to differ and to debate with her caringly instead of name-calling and discarding her. They didn't reject her. They engaged and respected her, even while rejecting what she had to say. And she began to look forward to conversations and debates with those particular people, began to listen to the viewpoints that opposed her own. And gradually, she became unable to defend her previous viewpoints. Phelps Roper left Westboro Baptist Church at the cost of being disowned by her own family. She has a wonderful TED Talk that describes that process. I invite you to locate that and to... Take it in. But once again, the people who showed love to Phelps Roper engaged her as a human being instead of engaging the mindset that possessed her. That's what we're called or invited to do in response to our enemies. We don't have to agree with them. We don't have to like them. We have to love them. It's helpful to recognize here that love is not merely an emotion or a feeling. Love is a decision to show caring, to seek and see and nurture the child of God in another, to give the best of ourselves to draw out the best in them. Isn't that what we do when we love someone? Give the best of ourselves to try to draw out the best in them? And love's easy with those who show love in return. It's harder with those who respond with hurt or hate. But love transforms. As Paul writes in 1 Corinthians, love bears all things, believes all things, hopes all things, endures all things. Love never ends. 
The final thing we must remember is that we're not responsible for loving this way on our own, thank goodness. In the words of the old hymn, did we in our own strength confide, our striving would be losing. We find the ability to love even the unlovely by drawing upon the unconditional love that shapes and transforms us. God's love. And we find encouragement in the difficult work of loving our enemies from each other. Do not try this alone. It will be a work in progress for me, this learning to love in the face of offense. I'm not there yet. I'm not going to get it right every day or every time. But I pray for God's continued work in helping me, helping all of us, to respond to the child of God in each other and not to the outward attitudes and actions that others may show. Anger can't cast out anger, and hatred can't cast out hate. Only love, only love can change the world. Amen.